so the next speaker is Alyssa Hensa. She has over 12 years of experience in the oil and gas industry and has worked both conventional and unconventional assets worldwide. She received her uh, bachelor degree from Cornwall University in 2003, followed by a PhD from Rutgers at the State University of New Jersey under Martha Witschak and Roy Slesha in 2009. Uh, and although rift systems were the focus of her dissertation, Alyssa is interested in any basin with a complex deformation history. And currently she's working at Equinor, uh, our office in Houston, on the deep water US Gulf of Mexico. Um, the work that will be presented, uh, she used physical modeling with clay to investigate how different properties uh, of pre-existing normal fault population affect the development of the new normal faults. So this work is relevant both for the traditional oil and gas exploration and for the carbon capture storage. This presentation will be recorded um, and there is also a longer version online already. So please ask the questions in the Teams chat as we go along and uh, we'll try to, to answer at the end of the presentation. Um, her presentation is then called Structural Inheritance in Rift Basins, Understanding Complex Fault Geometries and Interactions Through Physical Modeling. So please, Alyssa, we look forward to see your work. Thank you so much, Signa. And yes, it is my fault that we are having this meeting in what is the uh, afternoon in Norway because I am sitting in Houston where it is only 840 in the morning. And I very much appreciate you not asking me to get up significantly earlier to give this talk. So I'm going to be giving a um, talk that's based on my work that I did from my PhD, which I completed in 2009. And this work is still highly relevant both for um, traditional oil and gas exploration, but then also for carbon sequestration um, and really just anything in where you're looking at uh, complex fault patterns that you'd like to understand more in detail. So in a um, similar vein of Thomas's talk, um, I'm going to be talking about um, structural inheritance and rift basins. Um, I'm going to be looking at a bit of a different scale than Thomas, of course, because he was looking at outcrop scale and actually going up and touching the rocks, whereas I kind of created my own outcrops in the lab using physical modeling. And this picture here on the left, that is actually a picture of a top surface of one of my models. And it was um, on the cover of the APG Bulletin in November of 2017, just um, as kind of a intro to what some of the fault patterns I created look like. And this work then was um, again completed with my two PhD advisors here, Martha Withjack and Roy Schlesha, and done with the um, in the structure group at Rutgers uh, State University of New Jersey. So the outline of my talk is I'm going to give a brief introduction and the research objectives of this work. I'm going to then talk about the model setup that I used, and then we're going to go into a um, discussion of two series of models. Uh, the first of which is where I varied the angle between the extensional phases and the uh, models that I made. And then the second is where we varied the magnitude of extension during the first extensional phase. Um, the main references for this talk are these two papers from 2010 and 2011. So pretty much all of the figures that you're going to see in the talk are taken from these two papers. And there's more details in uh, the papers because I have to summarize for the sake of time. Um, I will also point out that this is actually kind of a snippet of a longer version of this talk that I gave last fall for the AAPG Petroleum Structure and Geomechanics Division. And if you'd like more uh, a more detailed talk, I also talk a little more about um, some later work that we've done more recently in this talk. Um, please take a look at their uh, YouTube page. If you search for me, you'll find a, it's about, I think, a 45 minute talk there. So just as an introduction, um, as we saw with Thomas's work, and I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, there are many basins throughout the world that have undergone multiple phases of extension, and, they and these often have differing extension directions through time. So we just got a nice look at the North Sea. Um, I also have here on the right a picture of a map from the Jean d'Arc Basin, which is offshore Nova Scotia. 
And what this map very nicely shows is that the fault patterns in these basins are commonly complex, and we often have multiple fault trends and fault interactions. And of course, as Thomas was alluding to, you know, we can only observe, observe the final fault patterns in nature. We can only observe the result of the deformation and sometimes even our observations that are limited at best, they're limited to outcrops and what we can see in seismic data. Um, but the advantage of using physical modeling is not only can we see the entire top surface, uh, we can also observe these faults um, growing and uh, forming through time. So it's not only allowing us to dictate the conditions under which the faults form, but then we can observe the results of that throughout the course of the model. And so the research objectives for my PhD were uh, in what ways do pre-existing normal faults influence the initiation, propagation, and geometry of new form faults. And here on the right, we have a picture of myself and Martha Withjack in the lab. And you can see here, this is the our model setup that we used. So we have a clay cake that we could then hang a camera above the model to capture at um, specific increments on um, the top surface of the model and watch it develop. And specifically, what I was investigating is how does the orientation of these pre-existing normal faults affect new fault development? And then also looking at how does the degree of development of the first phase fault population, so for example, the number, the length, and the displacement of the first phase normal faults affect this new fault development. And again, we did this using mainly our um, physical analog modeling. We also did look for some seismic examples for um, to use as analogs for the modeling results. But interestingly, at the time I was doing this, there wasn't a lot of uh, good uh, publications that really documented um, anything other than the final fault patterns in um, in uh, basins with multiple phases of extension. Um, since I published in 2010, 2011, there's been a great body of work that has come out um, by Oliver Duffy and a few other researchers that have really shown some of the variations in um, fault geometries with depth. And that's what I spent um, uh, the latest paper in this series, which I'm not discussing today, is in the um, YouTube other video, um, which is looking at more of the three dimensional, three dimensional variation in those um, fault populations and fault characteristics. So the model setup I used to investigate this, um, I am going to kind of step through this with both a map view of the model and then also the cross-sectional view just to so you can see how we layered the pieces to come up with our clay cake. So the base of our model has a, an eight centimeter wide rubber sheet in the middle and this is attached to a fixed rigid sheet and a mobile rigid sheet. And so then the zone of deformation that we are creating is centered on this eight centimeter rubber sheet here. And so then in cross section, you can see relatively that it's a relatively thin rubber sheet and the fixed um, rigid and mobile sheets above the clay cake. Then on top of the rubber sheet, I put a half centimeter thick layer of silicone polymer. And I did this because this layer of silicone polymer helps to decouple the clay layer from the underlying rubber sheet. So it allows the base of the clay layer to move more vertically during deformation. It's not forcing the displacement of the faults to zero at that um, rubber sheet boundary. It also makes it so that the zone is a little more diffuse and is it gives a little bit of a wider range for this def um, deformation zone here as opposed to being slightly more narrowed by the rubber sheet. So then on top of that, we put a layer of wet clay and it's approximately four centimeters thick on um, throughout most of the model, except over the middle where the silicone polymer is, where it's only three and a half centimeters thick. And we use wet clay for a few reasons. One of which is that the uh, fault propagation and the fault linkage that happens in clay is uh, more gradual than it is in sand models. So it makes it easier to document. It also leads to the development of more fault propagation folds more relay ramps, and more sinuous fault traces in the clay models than in the sand models. Um, in case you're wondering, the clay consistency is about uh, yogurt. It's, it's a very 
relatively it feels like a relatively thin clay. It's not like you're thinking potter's clay that you'd put on a potter's wheel. Um, but when we're deforming it at a rate of four centimeters an hour, it deforms brittily, as you saw in that um, my cover image, and you form um, very um, distinct faults and fault linkages that you can then document. So for the series of experiments, um, we based uh, the two series on kind of a singular base case. And this base case is that in, we have our initial model that I just described. And during the first phase of extension, we pulled um, the, the mobile sheet um, in a specified direction um, for three and a half centimeters at a specified rate of four centimeters an hour. Then we actually changed the direction of extension and moved it um, 45 degrees away from the initial extension direction and pulled again in the same rate and magnitude, just with a different direction. And so in doing this, we were able to create an initial fault fabric during the first phase of extension and then have a new fault fabric that's created during the second phase of extension that is influenced by this initial fault um, set. So then from this base case, the two series of models were then varying the angle of the second phase extension. So varying what angle we pulled this at during um, the second phase. Then we also varied the magnitude of first phase extension. So in that series, we kept the angle between the two phases the same and just varied how much we pulled um, the mobile sheet in the first phase. So now what I'm going to do is first we're going to start with looking at some pictures of the models of things that are consistent through both, throughout both series of experiments. And then I'll go more specifically into some of the um, results of the series one and the series two models. So I'm going to be showing a lot of photos of the top surface of the models. So let me take a moment just to orient you to those. So on the photos, there will be a little sun icon, and this indicates the lighting direction of the top surface of the model. So in this case, the lighting is from the top left. So the faults that are dipping toward the top left will appear bright, and the faults that are dipping toward the bottom right will appear dark. Uh, this is more obvious than if we're looking at this end of the second phase where we have multiple fault orientations and you can see some of the variations um, with the lighting that highlights some of the different dip directions. So in all of the models, we have normal faults that form in the zone above the silicone polymer during the first phase. And you can see that the strike of these faults is generally perpendicular to the extension direction. Um, you can also nicely see here some of the relay ramps and other vari uh, variations with fault length and displacement that you get in the clay models. And so you're ending up with a diffuse fault set throughout um, the area above that rubber sheet and polymer clay. Then if we look at the second phase, what we can see is that there are many first phase faults that are actually reactivating with oblique slip. So if we compare just for example this fault um, set here, we can see that this uh, the new faults here are reactivating. They're becoming, you can see that they're becoming wider and this was the main way of measuring the um, some of the statistics for the models was looking at the fault heaves that you could see on the photographs. But then also we can zoom in on a fault like this one here and take an oblique photo and see that there are actually corrugations on the fault surface. So we can see that there appears to be a vertical set of slicken lines or corrugations that correspond to the first phase. And then we can actually see that there is an oblique set that corresponds to the second phase of extension. And this is a nice way to help confirm the oblique nature of these faults as they're reactivating. We will also often have lines on the top surface of the clay layer. So this is just as we're building the model, um, just having a few ever so slight indentations in the top surface, which work help with strain markers, which is then helpful as we trace various faults through time, especially during the second phase, to see how the displacement of these used to help to confirm, especially in some of these smaller faults that don't have a lot of vertical displacement, to confirm their um, motion direction. So in addition to reactivating the first phase faults with oblique slip, what we also see is there are obviously a fair number of new normal faults that form on the top surface of the clay model during the second phase. Most of these new faults initiate at the first phase faults and propagate outward. So if we look at kind of a zoom in of this box here on the end of second phase model, 
you can see that I've highlighted a few faults here that they actually initiated at the first face fault and propagated outward. And I took photos every oh, 0.2 centimeters of displacement I or as we were running the model. So this is how I could trace it and actually watch it back through time is to see, OK, you can watch and through the photos. OK, we can see the fault start here and then grow outward. So those are kind of the similarities between all of the models. And now I'm going to talk about the two series of experiments that I conducted. So the first series of models is uh, varying the angle between uh, the first phase extension direction and the second phase extension direction. And what I have here then indicated um, is this arrow in each of the photos indicates the extension direction for that phase. So you can see for uh, all of the um, first phase models, they are all the same. And the variation here comes in the second phase with that angle of extension. And again, you can, and these you can also see the um, lines on the top surface of the model which are helping to indicate the offset of various faults in the, within the model and you can also very nicely see how the lighting direction highlights the um, fault surfaces which is very helpful for looking at the uh, relative magnitude of oblique versus um, normal motion on these faults. One important feature in this is in comparing the um, fault patterns that we see kind of if we look across this suite at the bottom between model one and model four. And hopefully you can see that the fault patterns are produced to look very different. So we can see then in the model one, which is again that base case I talked about, we have kind of a certain amount of displacement on these first phase faults, which I previously pointed out is a oblique extension during the second phase. But we can see that the amount of offset on the first phase faults appears to increase as we go from model one to model four. So the amount of extension and the magnitude of displacement on these models is all the same, but what we're actually seeing is the relative amount of oblique versus normal offset. So if I kind of now show a line drawing of those, it helps to really kind of highlight the amount of offset on that for those first phase faults here. And you can really see that there you were, have increasing dip slip component on the first phase faults. So model four, where you have the smallest angle between the two phases, we're seeing the largest dip slip component, we're seeing the largest fault heaves. Whereas with model one, where we have the largest angle between the extension directions, we're seeing much more of a strike slip component and we're seeing not nearly as much of a vertical fault heave on the top surface of the model. So in addition to that, uh, we can also look at the amount of new fault growth between the different models. And what you can see again, if we're comparing model one to model four, there are significantly more faults that are approximately perpendicular to the second phase extension direction in model one than there are in model four. And so in general, there is a decreasing number of new faults during the second phase of extension as we kind of decrease the angle between the extension directions. So we can also then see uh, as we kind of compare through the models that there are many new faults that are actually oblique to the second phase extension direction. They aren't actually perpendicular to that E2. Um, some of this is a function of the clay thickness and density that we use. Um, if you have a thicker clay cake, um, the, your fault spacing will be affected and therefore you may end up with different fault orientations. But a lot of this is actually due to how again the, the second phase faults grow. So as I showed in our base case, we have the um, second phase faults that are propagating outward from the first phase. And over here on the right, I have a more detailed example of that, of capturing um, a line drawing from a series of photographs showing that we have this second phase fault here that initiates at the first phase fault and propagates outward. And once it reaches a certain distance away from that first phase fault, it actually changes orientation. So initially the fault is perpendicular to the first phase fault, but then as it propagates away, it bends to kind of become aligned more with that regional extensional direction. And so depending on the fault spacing, you may or may not get a fault able to propagate far enough so that is orthogonal to the applied extension direction. So 
the main piece to take away from this first series of models is that if you're looking at just the fault patterns um, at any given level, either in seismic or in an outcrop, that the um, information that you're giving, getting just from the end state and the visual, excuse me, can be a little misleading. So in looking at these photos, you may think that the um, magnitude of second phase extension differed between them. You may think that, oh, well, clearly the angle between the two extensional faces and this may be closer to 90 because you see a lot of orthogonal fault patterns. And in fact, as I've just shown you, that it's the angle is at most 45 degrees. So taking just the final fault patterns and then trying to infer the deformational history does have a bit of risk to it. Um, as I said previously, the normal, new normal faults will commonly initiate at pre-existing normal faults. They will propagate outward perpendicular to the pre-existing fault. And if they have enough space after um, the distance, um, whatever is the local stress field here related to the first phase fault, then they will bend to be orthogonal to the regional extensional direction. Uh, the other piece is that the amount of dip slip versus strike slip on reactivated faults is definitely not proportional to the magnitude of extension. And one of the dangers then of seismic data is, of course, we can't zoom into the fault and look for slip indicators unless we happen to have a core through it. And so looking at just the amount of displacement on the fault and making inferences about magnitude of extension can be dangerous. So now quickly I'm going to talk about the second series of models that we conducted and this is where we varied the initial fabric development. So instead of varying the angle between the two extensional phases, we varied the amount of displacement during the first phase. And the result of this is that you're controlling the degree of development of this first phase fault population. So you're affecting the spacing of the faults, you're affecting the length of the faults, and you're affecting the displacement of the faults. So this is a very handy way to try and investigate a little more of the what the magnitude of structural inheritance can do in affecting new fault populations. And so if we're looking at just the end of the first phase versus end of the second phase, one thing that becomes very clear is that the degree of development of this first phase fault population, which is in this column here, um, definitely influences the fault geometries that develop during the second phase of extension. So the poorly developed first phase in which you can barely see faults at the top surface of the clay model. And in here, uh, all of these observations, of course, are made on the top surface. The fault um, fabric may be more developed at depth, but we can't observe that. So it, it's all based on what we can see on the top surface of the clay. But in model B, where we have the smallest magnitude of extension during the first phase, we can see that the second phase fault pattern is a series of long parallel normal faults that form. And these are approximately perpendicular to the second phase extension direction. Then if we have moderately developed first phase faults, what we see is that many of the new normal faults link with the reactivated first phase faults, and these form composite faults with zigzag geometries. So especially in model C, this is where we're seeing faults that maybe don't have an orientation that's perpendicular to either extension direction. We're seeing a lot of fault linkages and cutting across, and it's becoming a much more complicated fault pattern. Once we get to a well-developed first phase fault pattern, what we also what we see during the second phase is that the new normal faults are intersecting the reactivated faults, and they're doing this by either cutting across them or by originating or terminating at them, similar to what I was just discussing. And the interesting thing about this is it's very easy to classify this fault pattern at the end of the second phase and say, okay, well, you know, this is what we had initially and this is what we ended up with and then, okay, this is how we got to kind of this end pattern. But because we could document the top surface of the clay model throughout, the models go through an evolution of all of the different types of fault patterns depending on their, the amount of extension during the first phase. So for example, in models B, we only see kind of a parallel fault fabric because the initial fabric is very poorly developed. But if we go to model E, which had the very well-developed initial fabric, we see there are times at which we can observe a parallel geometry. There are times at which we can observe a zigzag geometry, and there are times where we can observe an intersecting geometry. So it really depends on the magnitude of extension during both phases for what you're observing in the fault pattern.
I also like to think of this as kind of instead of being time steps, um, also either time or depth slices. So it could be that in deeper, you would have maybe more of an intersecting fault pattern, whereas if you get um, more shallower levels, you may have a parallel fault pattern, thinking more of not just as a development in time, but as we're also looking at maybe the development in depth and as faults are propagating upward. So, now just a little bit of a zoom in on some of those fault linkages. And as I just said, the linkage of the first phase and second phase faults, it creates composite faults with zigzag geometries. And here I have zoomed in on a very nice example of the zigzag geometry. And what I've done is then to highlight it, I've uh, made a series of line drawings over on the right to show us how the um, various faults grew during the deformational phase. Um, one of the problems with the, the Model C and the zigzag fault geometries is it's very difficult to photograph. So it you can see that we have a series of faults here that kind of link together, but ca catching the various orientations with the lighting directions, especially during the model, is challenging. But you can see as we look over at the line drawings here, we have some oblique slip segments that generally have a fair amount of displacement early on. Um, again, these are perpendicular to the first phase extension direction. And then you have the faults that are perpendicular to the second phase extension direction coming in that are appear um, smaller on the top surface of the clay model. And as time progresses, they begin to link with those first phase faults and then form through going faults. And so related to this, you can also look at the fault interactions on the top surface of the clay models and not only how, OK, we can see this fault links with this fault, but also a well, what percentage of different types of fault interactions are present. And so I documented two main types of fault interactions, and I alluded to this earlier. Um, there's the new faults that terminate against pre-existing faults. So these are faults that maybe initiate at one first phase fault and propagate outward, and then they stop at another first phase fault. There's also then the new new faults that cut across and offset pre-existing faults. So this fault here, I could watch it, you know, initiate, propagate from again, this first phase fault, propagate outward and actually cut and offset another first phase fault. And the interesting thing about this is you can see examples of both of these types of interactions in most of the models, but the relative importance of the one versus the other type of interaction changes throughout um, the models and the magnitude of first phase extension. So obviously the total number of fault interactions is related to the total number of faults. So we can look at the number of interactions for each model and see, okay, there's fewest interactions in the model that had the um, weakest first phase fabric, most fault interactions in the model that has the strongest first phase fabric. We can see for the most part, the new faults that cut across and offset pre-existing faults are more prominent than the new faults that terminate pre-existing faults. But then if we look at the relative percentage of these interactions, what we can see is that the model E has its most even between the two different types of interaction. So this in, in, in model E, we have kind of 60% of the faults are second phase faults that cut and offset versus 40% that are originating and terminating. Whereas in model C, where we see that zigzag fabric, we're seeing a lot more faults that are cutting and offsetting versus uh, the second phase faults that are um, terminating against them. So the magnitude of first phase extension is not only affecting the final fault patterns, but the interactions between those and which is uh, important not only just in general to understand the evolution of the fault patterns, but then you also get into questions about, OK, well, what does this mean for fault sealing? What does this mean for compartmentalization? And there's a few other implications that you can take from this and actually thinking about how the faults initiate and propagate and may cut across for any sort of um, fault seal or just compartmentalization. So to summarize then the series two models, uh, the fault patterns in the models belong to one of three categories. Uh, there, there's the parallel category, the zigzag, and the intersecting. And the dominance of these first phase faults relative to the second phase faults really depends on the magnitude of extension during both phases of deformation. And this is where I really think it's important to think about not only your particular level that you're looking at, but then also looking at um, the fault patterns above and below to get an understanding of how the fault geometries may change not only laterally, but also with depth.
And with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Alyssa, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I see there are no questions in the chat. 